They got introduced to me first. So nice to see so many people out for history here in Alphabet. We can send her. We can chance send her back while we're waiting. States in the 1850s was roughly split between slave and free states. 
progressives wanted to take all that land that we had got from France and Louisiana purchased up in here and form them into states. Stephen Douglas, who would later debate Lincoln, was the prime mover of the, the design to bring Kansas and Nebraska into the Union. Unfortunately, they came up with a really, really bad idea on how to do it, which was they were going to let the people in the territories vote as to whether they would be slave or free. Owen, a little bit older, with most of his brothers, went down to Kansas to swell the ranks of those who would vote um, for uh, <coughs> abolition for a free state. John followed it in 1855. There were minor skirmishes, but then in 1856, pro-slavery forces came from Missouri and looted the town of Lawrence in Kansas. At the same time, the same week, Preston Brooks, a congressman from South Carolina, incensed by what Charles Sumner had said about the Kansas situation, entered the Senate and clubbed him almost to death with a cane. This so enraged John Brown that he ordered his sons to arm themselves with broadswords. And they went and grabbed five pro-slavery men and hacked them to death. Owen was one of them, as well as his son-in-law, Henry Thompson, and others of the brothers. This act was an, had an immediate and profound effect upon the nation. People were getting killed now, not for action, but for status. That if you were pro-slavery, you were going to get killed. It also turned out to be a tryout for these six men, who were the call, ended up being called the Secret Six. They were wealthy, wealthy Northerners who were looking to fund, essentially, jihadists, if you will, to fight for the abolitionist cause. They settled on John Brown basically because of the Potawatomi Massacre. And then they prepared for Harper's Ferry. Harper's Ferry, if you don't know what it is, is where the Shenandoah River meets the Potomac. Um, Virginia is here. Maryland is here. There was a U.S. arsenal, that's it, right there. The ice, John Brown and his children, including Owen and others, there were 25 in the, in the group, rented a farm in Maryland called the Kennedy Farm. The idea was that John would go down to the Harbors Ferry capture the armory, and then Owen and others would follow and exploit that and precipitate a slave rebellion. Everything went wrong. Um, they never made it inside the armory, but rather the citizens of Harbor Ferry drove them into a firehouse. They fought it out for a couple of days until the Marines under Colonel Robert E. Lee showed up, broke down the doors, capturing or killing all of them. John Brown was tried for treason. Here he is, still wounded in his bed. <clears throat> he had the opportunity to claim that he was insane, and that's what his lawyers told him to do. But I think at that point, he realized that it was more important for him to die as a sane man standing up against slavery than to save his own life by, by saying he was insane. He was convicted and taken out famous photograph or famous painting, which I don't know has any truth in it at all, although there's anecdotal accounts that this is what happened and was hung in December 1859. Now, in many cases, that'd be the end of the story, right? He was a criminal, he killed people, he was treasonous, he got hung, but that's not what happened. What happened was apotheosis. He became a martyr. He became a larger-than-life individual. There's a, a quote I remember reading that more than any other private citizen of the United States, John Brown altered the course of history. Think about that. I mean, not talking about presidents or generals or anything. He's just a private citizen. People were up in arms. And there was a song. It's John Brown's body, and his soul keeps marching on. 
And as the Civil War exploded, all those young men fought, felt they were following John Brown into a cause of righteousness to free the slaves, those that were interested in freeing the slaves, although that wasn't everybody on the Union side. And John Brown became <laughs> the screaming, violent personification of abolition. As for Owen, Owen and five others fled. Two of them, looking for food, were hung. They made it to a Quaker colony in Pennsylvania who smuggled, us up, smuggled them up to Ohio, and then up to these islands in Lake Erie. John Jr. had bought a farm on Put-In Bay. This farm's actually right here. And that's where Owen lived. He had a price on his head. Um, whether it was ever going to be enforced past, after the Civil War, who knows. But that's where he lived. He lived in a sh uh, shack on John Brown Jr.'s um, land. And then there's an island here called Gibraltar, which is owned by a financier named Jay Cook. They built a castle on there. And during the winter, Owen would be his caretaker, his day there. So for 20 years, this is where Owen lived. And this is what he looked like during that time. You can see this is a man who's seen things he didn't really want to see and experienced things he didn't really want to experience. Arrival in Southern California. The first to come out was Jason. Jason was against violence. He did not partake in any of the, the um, violent acts of his father or brothers. Unfortunately, after Potawatomi, he was seized and jailed for a, quite a while just because of being the brother of, uh, or the son of Tom Brown. When he came to Pasadena in, in 1881, the town had about 500 inhabitants. It was pretty much wide open spaces and still pretty much the Indiana colony um, than what it was in founding. This was the center of town, Fair Oaks in Colorado, at about that time. He bought land up in Las Casitas, the area that's called the Meadows now in West Altadena. This is a later 1890s photograph, so there's um, buildings there that weren't there at the time, but you do get the sense of the barrenness of the place. But he bought it farmed it, you know, made a living, had a life. He was followed by Ruth Thompson, his sister, and her husband, Henry Tom Thompson, who was also at Potawatomi. Um, Ruth was the eldest daughter of John Brown and had accompanied him on many of his travels. She arrived in Southern California on Thanksgiving Day, 1884, and she had also been living in put in May uh, with John Jr. Finally, uh, Owen came out in 1885, although there's, there's differing accounts. The accounts are kind of all over the place. If you look at the primary, even the, and the primary and the secondary sources, there's a lot of different difference about when he came out. <coughs> but I think what they were all looking for was a good climate, because they were all in their, you know, in their 60s or close to, and quiet. It was a little farming community, and they thought that they could have a nice, peaceful end of life here in Pasadena. Unfortunately for them, during the 1880s, Pasadena started to transform into a resort town. This was spearheaded by the creation of the Raymond Hotel in 1886. Rich Easterners now were coming out on the Santa Fe to look around this wonderful Pasadena place looking for things to be involved in um, amusements for themselves. Included in this were a lot of people who were in what was the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the Union Veterans Association. Pasadena was a very strong union town. And if you think about who these men were in the 1880s, if they were in their 20s when they were fighting the Civil War, they were in their 40s and 50s now, they had none of the great ideas we have about John Brown. They thought, saw John Brown as a hero, as a martyr, as the person who had transformed this country. 
And at the same time, they had seen a lot of their friends die in really horrible ways. And so they had the idea that they couldn't really go against, you know, they didn't really want to second guess um, the ideas that they had about John Brown. Many of them were wealthy. You know, it's this man over here, lost an arm during the war. And they were looking for things to invest. This is a little bit later. This is uh, late 1880s with Professor Lowe over, those, over here <coughs> trying to get their money. <coughs> In 1886, <coughs> there was a, um, a large uh, GAR um, encampment in, the, the, in Los Angeles. And many of them came uh, to Pasadena. And it was this where they had a really famous event, which I think actually kind of shocked um, the Brown brothers and uh, the Thompsons. After a meeting of the GAR, which the Thompsons and, the, and Owen and Jason had attended, um, they went out to get in their carriage. Uh, 50 Union men on, on, horse, on, 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 on the, the horses, took the horses off the carriage and they pulled the carriage up and down Colorado Boulevard singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic at the top of their lungs. That's the carriage up there. Um, I think that's not really what the Browns wanted. Um, they'd had enough of that. They just wanted to be, they wanted to have peace. And so they ended for, headed for the refuge of the mountains. The first cabin they stayed in was the El Prieto cabin. This is a aerial from 1935, but it gives a, a, a fairly good idea of what the land looked like. They, this is Las Cas what was then originally Las Casitas, now the Meadows, the Lark Canyon on this side, El Prieto on this side. Um, that's a little round top, which we'll talk about in a little while. But the, the El Prieto Cabin was probably at the junction of, of the major um, stem of El Prieto and this little tributary here, but the cab was burned in 1896, and so we don't know for a fact where it was. It was a nice little cab, and there's indications that it was built by the Thompsons um, before the um, Brown brothers lived in it. I like that they have the, the, the ladder in the tree. That's a nice touch. They expanded the cabin, and then Ruth came to visit them when they were living there again a tree going through the room. <laughs> and they cut down some yucca stalks as kind of decorative things. The, this little line sign right here says that it's the Thompson's cabin. I think it might have been the Thompson's cabin. Um, at any rate, for whatever reasons, they moved out of there and they moved up to the Mesa cabin, which is where most of the photographs of them were taken. Um, this is a little round top, which is a little knoll that's above the Mesa. And then up here is the Mason Cabin, where the Mason Cabin was. It's a testament to the kind of fame of these guys, how many photographs were taken of them. So the, this is just when they moved up to the Mason. Obviously, they're roughing it, but they're making their flapjacks. Um, they quickly built themselves a little cabin. The kitchen's still outside. But uh, they got the cabin up, and <coughs> most of the windows in. And here's the cabin finished. Notice that they have figured out that there's a lot of high winds in the San Gabriel Mountains, and they're propping it up. Um, and people gave them the livestock. They, they tried, you know, they tried to tell people, don't give us stuff, but people just kept giving them stuff. This is a view of their cabin looking down to the south. There's a little round top there. That's the two of them standing out front. And this is looking from a little round top back at the cabin. And in this photograph, you can see one of the things that they were interested in doing. They had thought that they were going to build a trail all the way up to the Papa Brown Mountain. And that was, you know, maybe they were gonna make some little money that way. They didn't have a lot of money. And you can just see the outline of the trail right here. I have been up there more than once looking for it, and there's no sign of it. John Jr. came out from Ohio to visit with them. And the whole family came up. And that's John Jr., uh, um, Jason, and Owen. And always somebody with a gun. 
<laughs> this is one of my favorite photographs of them. Um, they're on burrows, but the reason I really like it is because of this guy right here. In 1885, 1886, Pasadena had a series of anti-Chinese, I have to call them riots. Um, people were th taken out of their businesses, um, driven out of town. The quote unquote established members of society in Pasadena made an arrangement that there would be no Pasadena or Chinese businesses in Pasadena. And in the midst of this, Owen said, you know, as a former rebuke said, I'm hiring a Chinese guy, and that's him. And so this is how they, I think, believed that they were going to finish it up. They were going to live in their little cabin and explore the mountains and live a life of quiet contemplation. But then Owen died. Both Owen and Jason were big temperance guys. Um, and they, had, from what I understand, had very few vices um, that we know about. Uh, the story is that in December uh, 1888, he attended a, the two brothers attended a, a large temperance meeting and they were so <coughs> overcome by it that um, they gave their last streetcar money uh, to the collection plate and walked home in the rain. There's also a story that Owen was walking home and he just decided to lie down and he fell asleep outside uh, in the rain. Uh, at any rate, uh, Owen developed pneumonia and died. Um, his funeral was kind of an amazing affair. By this time, Pasadena, 1889, Pasadena was nearing 4,000 people. 2,000 people attended his funeral. So if you think about it, probably up to this time and in any future I can contemplate, he had the most people by percentage of any funeral that's ever going to be had in Pasadena. This was the parade out of town. The plan had been to bury Owen on Brown Mountain, but there was no way to get up there. So instead, they chose to bury him on Little Round Top. This is the beginning of the gathering up on the top. And this is the whole group interring him on January 10th, 1889. His brother planted a red cedar that had been brought from Ohio uh, at his grave, a simple wooden um, plaque. One of his sisters did this watercolor of it. But there was a feeling that <coughs> there should be a better mark, um, something more substantial for this son of John Brown. There was a lot of interest in the grave. Again, you have these West East, uh, wealthy Easterners going up and looking at the grave. And finally, a, a person named Major Rust, um, who was a friend of the family, started a subscription to, to buy a new stone. And here it is. This is really one of the most amazing photographs of this time in Southern California. I have ever seen. There are very, very few photographs where you see the intermingling of the races um, in this era. And I think, frankly, part of it is because it was early enough, near enough to the Civil War and to abolitionism, for that feeling to maintain. And I believe it, in many ways, disappeared in Pasadena during the early part of the 20th century with the segregation and other uh, acts against uh, non-whites. If you look in the photograph, there's the old gravestone there in this man's head. And the tree has died and will be pulled up soon. Five people preached. Um, a quartet sang. Um, the thing took two and a half hours and there were 200 people there. So you're only seeing a 
This is the new uh, stone, taken about 1907 by Gerald Brown, one of the grandsons of John Brown. He's a young boy that came down with the stone in 1914. As time passed, fires burned away most of the traces of the Brown brothers in the area. The stone did burn, but it was covered only to be rediscovered occasionally by historians. And that's how the area languished until something new happened, the meadows. In the 1950s, Davis Baker developed a subdivision called the Meadows. It what used to be called Las Casinas. This is how Las Casinas looked in 1930s. This is how it looks today. So all this housing was put in. Here's the little round top here. With the development of the Meadows, people started hiking in the area. The famous Painter Charles White and his wife Frances moved into the area, living right below Little Round Top. This is his son Ian at the gravestone. And then, interestingly enough, this is the last photograph I have where the gravestone is in its proper place over Owen's grave because there were other visitors to Little Round Top. On motorcycles. The Little Round Top developed into quite a popular jump area for motorcycles. And they delighted in taking the grave stone, which is shaped like a cigar, and rolling it down the hill. The Forest Service finally put it in concrete and put this shaped fence around it, but they put it in the wrong place. Um, the this is the eastern edge of the top of Little Round Top. The grave is actually on the western edge of, the, of Little Round Top. But people still came and visited. It didn't matter. They wanted to come and see the stone. And here it was before the next step, which was the fire. The, the most usual way to get to Little Round Top was to go up El Prieto Road and then up the El Prieto Fire Road and then up here, and that's where the gravestone was. This part of it right here was technically private property. Here's the road back in the 1970s. The kids sitting in the cul de sac at the end of the county maintained road, and here's the road. At some point in the 70s, they put one of these standard little yellow pipe fences in. But then in 1999, Lincoln Water, in cahoots with these property owners here, put a, a fence. I was approached at that time to get involved as an attorney for the people who wanted to restore access. I couldn't do it because I was involved in Rubio Canyon. But after a certain amount of time of dealing with this young lady, Mary Trailer, who was probably one of the most unpleasant people I've ever met, <laughs> I was finally persuaded to get involved. I, fi I, I, I filed suit in 2002. We got a judgment in 2004. We defended them at appeal in 2006 and the wall came tumbling. <laughs> and this is actually kind of cool because this happened in the dead of night. All of a sudden we just went up there and somebody had taken a torch and just taken it. <laughs> and uh, they said, well, we're going to play back. I said, we'll see you. We'll see you in front of Judge Simpson. And I didn't do that. But at the same time that was happening, in 2002, another set of private property sites started to go up. And these were kind of bizarre and made out of bits and pieces of trash because they were replaced by Mike Keechy, who had decided that he was going to live his hippie lifestyle out to the end. 
right next to Little Round Top. He had bought the land that the grave site was on. And he said, all these people trying to get up here are bumming me out. Nobody gets to come up here anymore. But this is the kind of guy he was. I mean, if we didn't get him, county regional planning was going to get him. I mean, this is the trash that he left around. But at the end of the day, and he was aggressive. Uh, this is Tim Brick uh, trying to get up to Little Round Top. And he said, stay back. And then Tim said, get your hands off me. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's their way he did that. He was really fancy. But we do the same old remedy. We sue him, and we get a judgment. And then everybody gets to come. And people have hiked up there in all ways to the top of the little round top. And there was singing, and there was speechifying. <laughs> but mostly people were just there to love where they were, that the people had actually won one, that public access had been restored to an important place. And America had finally tried for once. <laughs> and now you can still go there. This was last year and see the sign that was left now that the, the stone is, at this time this one was shot, the stone hadn't been found. So we have a couple of things left to do. First, the case of the missing headstone. This is probably the last picture of the headstone taken before it disappeared. Times reported it. It, re it disappeared probably around June 2002. Uh, you know, they asked me about it, I said, the only person who took it was Kichi. But it appears that at this point, what he did was he just rolled it down the hill. And there it is. The same young man that we saw earlier, the son of Charles White, Ian White, discovered it without, when he was out for a walk. He called me. I grabbed my, my father's uh, client's dolly, and we put it on that and rolled it down to Ian's house. <laughs> and that's where it's been. Well, now, people have said, well, where is the, the gravestone? Well, it's safe. Um, I think there's a reasonable concern um, if all that's happened to the gravestone that we don't want it to get damaged or hurt again. And so I believe that when there is the right time, is it will be out where the public can embrace it. So recent developments. So we've got kind of a really neat kind of halfway thing, which is Ian had talked to me about this a while ago, which is cast, making a casting of the stone. And so this is a casting of the stone. It's in the Monument Park, which is right over here, right in front of the, the sheriff's station. It was placed there in 2017, I think, and that's how it looks now. And it's it's nice because you can look at it, and it's it looks just like the stuff. I mean, it's great. And well, like I said, we'll, we'll figure out what what should happen with the original. This is a nice thing to have out. There. The other thing involves <laughs> what has to be the other great contentious thing of West Altadena, Lavinia. Mm -hmm. When Lavinia, this is Lavinia. Though, when Lavinia was built out, this area right here was supposed to be a school, right? Um, I don't think it's anybody's fault that it didn't become a school. Uh, but, you know, it did. So the guy who owns it was one of the original um, developers of Lavinia, Tim Cantwell, and he wanted to put 17 houses on it. And of course, if you've been fighting about the vineyard since 1985, which a lot of people have, you know, the idea that he is going to make money off this was just kind of crazy. But two women, Michelle Zach and Mary Beth Krull, had a better idea, which was, why don't you do something for the community that will help us 
and we will in turn support your desire for these homes. And the deal that they made was Cantwell would buy the gravesite, the five acres that surround the, the Kichio that, su that surrounds the gravesite, and then turn it over to a conservancy along with three hundred thousand dollars to fund different programs. And this was enshrined in the county's decision on it. You see right there, implement the parity plan, concept which is currently the developer will secure property which contains the grave site of Owen Brown. And so Campbell has bought the ground. The, the next steps are tied to him getting a final map approval on the, the 17 homes. But this is going to happen, and it's really wonderful. And so it seems that the gravesite is now finally secure. And people will be able to, and that little round top will remain a public place where one can commune with the spirit of Owen Brown and the legacy of John. Jason, what was his Oh, name? Jason, Jason went back to Ohio, he was from Akron, and he had a wife and child, and apparently he left his wife and child a lot. Um, he liked to roam, he liked going out in nature, but he went back to Akron and died in 1912. Back in the back. Yeah, do they know exactly where he's at, and is the stone going to go right where he was? There, at this point, there are no no firm decisions about what what that is. There's um, when we settled the uh, Kichi case, um, say the Aldean Trails, which was the uh, the the uh, unincorporated association that was the plaintiff, received the right to make a memorial up there. We never did. Um, I I would like to see something at the place of his of where he's buried. I can tell you where it is. It's, if you just look at the ridge lines around you. It out. It's not that big complex, but you know I think anything that's happened is going to take time. One of the things that, that we don't want to do is having you know, unilateral decision making. You know, this is going to there's going to be a, a committee of I believe five people that are going to be involved in, in guiding this process with Little Round Top, 
and there'll be a lot of community involved, and, and I think we'll get it right this time. Okay, anybody? Yes? What became of the guy that was living there with all that junk around? He's dead. Did he live there till he died? No, he was chased off. He um, he was arrested. Oh, I'm so sorry, what happened to Mr. Kichi? Mr. Kichi, besides the fact that he was unlawfully keeping people from going on the trails around Blue Ramza, was also in violation of uh, county regulations. He was living on vacant land and he was also putting trash on it. He, vacant land has to be vacant. And he was actually prosecuted by the, the county. He was jailed for a day. Um, and then he disappeared. He was he was kind of a flip flip. He he had five different addresses in a lot of different places, and he tended to go to places very rural places and make a big mess. But then ultimately he died, and Mr. Cantwell bought the um, little round top from his estate or from the, the court. Next, anybody else? Back in the back. Yo, oh, hi, Michelle.
that's another thing that's a little bit unclear. There was, there were, there was certainly a price on his head um, for a number of years, and there are there is some, you know, uh, evidence that the reason that that Owen felt he could leave was that the price that the the you know the bounty or the the charge had been rescinded. I kind of doubt that anybody after the Civil War would have prosecuted Owen Brown for, I don't think you'd find 12 men in Ohio, because only men were on the jury set, but 12 men in Ohio that were convicted. So, I mean, but he lived on an island in the middle of Lake Erie. So he had a certain amount of, and, you know, and there was always this, the talk that he was always carrying the, 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 Navy, the Navy pistols, but, those that's talk. Yeah, go ahead. Can you comment on one of the uh, sons when he worked up Mount Low, for Thaddeus Low? Yeah. Uh, the question was about uh, uh, a son working for Thaddeus Low. Jason worked for um, uh, on the Mount Low Railway, and actually, I, I just came across a new photograph of him on Echo Mountain that I'd never seen before. Actually, sitting down and resting, but there's a fairly famous one in Charles Symes' book. Um, where they show, it's, it's, the, the, the caption talks about it being the cook tent, right? But you see Jason right in front doing lock work. And if you know anything about the Mount Hall Railway and, and, and going up there, they have some beautiful dry rock uh, walls up there, no mortar walls. And a lot of those, I believe, were built by Jason. Um, and this is when he was 62, 60, no, he was older, he was the oldest, so he was older than um, than Owen, so he was about 65 years old, which is old at that time. Yeah, Michelle. Um, I would just like to say that in terms of preserving the grave site, that Marietta and I had a lot to do with it, but it was really a committee of the town council that uh, uh, through the land use committee, and it was really a partnership of um, Altadena Heritage and the town council and the county and Tim Campwell put out the money. So it's not really quite fair to say that it was just Marietta and I. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, over here. So what happened to Pasadena? There was this hotbed of abolitionists and you know Owen Brown was a hero and John Brown and then there was as as then. as places as people came in they brought their prejudices with them. Pasadena grew quickly. It grew from 4,000 in 1890 to 10,000 in 1900, and on and on. And also, there were there were nativist movements, um, and there was already a nativist movement in Pasadena against the Chinese um, prior to the turn of the century. It's just that the abolitionists were, you know, saw didn't see the Chinese. They probably didn't, they didn't see the, the blacks and the Chinese. As Equivalent, but Pasadena, like most towns, stratified into segregated communities. Um, it always amazes me. I was just coming up uh, Lincoln yesterday, and everybody who wasn't white was shoved up in the Northwest Pasadena. So on Lincoln, you have all these Japanese shops because the Japanese couldn't live in most. Of as well. So that, that, that happened, you know, and Pasadena changed a whole lot in those, those, those first 30 years. Just happened. Yeah. Um, what was the draw to come from Gibraltar to Pasadena? How did he even know? That's that? a very good question. I, um, I think he was of an age where he, I mean, those are really brutal winters mm -hmm. um, out there on Lake Erie. I can tell you that. And his family, his family was here, so he felt he had some kind of core. It wasn't just Ruth and, and Henry Thompson came up, but they brought their whole family, and they had grandchildren by then. So there was a core of people that he could they could live with. And I think their idea was this is a nice, quiet, rural place to, where it doesn't snow um, that we can live. Why would anybody come to California for Christ's sake? Jason, I think Jason. Jason was the key because he came out and actually had a, made a go of it. Um, 
but I think only just one agenda. Yeah. Um, I, I can just add to that that the reason that the Browns came to Pasadena is because it was settled by abolitionists yeah. and because it was union supporters. And there was uh, a lot of um, historians think that the guys suffered from PTSD and they did feel that it was a safer place for them to be um, because, you know, just in terms of security, because they would be surrounded by uh, kind of more like-minded people. All right. This How old was Owen when he died? 64. Well, I'm sorry, how old was Owen when he died? He was 64. It's not actually on the tombstone. Yeah. Uh, I just want to let everybody know I'm with the uh, Pasadena Civil War Roundtable. We're having a lecture tomorrow at 7 o'clock at the Central Library, and the subject is on abolition. Where is that going to be? At the Central Library in Pasadena. Very good. So I'm talking. 7.15 to Marietta. You know, I just, thank you, Paul. I really, really enjoyed this talk. And I do want to say that the Lavinia battle was very intense. And the people that were here in the mid 80s up until the evening up in the summer came home, they brought 200 people to a meeting, still enraged about Lavinia and what happened and how the community felt cheated. But I want you to know, when Michelle and I finally started to get our head around this great opportunity with the town council, we decided we would go and just call Jim Campbell out of the blue. We'd send him over to town. We donate things all over the country. He's huge on veteran homes, full service veteran homes. So you know, it's always good to remember as much as people seem like somebody you won't like, that might not be the case. And Michelle and I met him over here at Memorial Park and we had a discussion with him. And we said to him, you know, all this time, the Vina has been held at bay behind the gates, and the community's never really invited them back in. And so Michelle and I stood there and we said to Tim, here's an opportunity, an opportunity to do something really great for this community. You know, a lot of stars from Lavinia, but you can end it here. And we asked him, would you like to join us? Put on your donator hat, take off your developer hat. Walked over that grave site, and I'm telling you, his personality changed just like that. And Michelle and I had the greatest conversation with him, and so I just want to remind all of us that even though we might have stars from Lavinia, the results of it right now couldn't be better. We got the crown jewel of this hill to protect forever, and this community will protect it. And uh, so I just want to say thanks to Campbell Anderson. It's hard to believe I'm the one saying that. <laughs> but no, it, it, it's just, it, it's been one of the greatest things I've ever been involved with, I have to tell you. So I do want to thank him for giving this to the community and resolving an issue that was going to be a thorn in the sight of El Tadena from the very thing that was So thank you, Paul. Thank you folks.